Kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome here. Manoa lele. Uh, Talofa lava. Welcome. It's good to um, gather again for this coming Sunday and to worship together, albeit from a, a distance. The theme for today is about a timeless moment of stillness, particularly in the midst of suffering and stress. Namihi, the welcome. We give thanks for arriving safely to a new day, for the gift of vision to see the world and the gift of grace to be at home. In our lives, the waves of possibility breaking on the shore of dawn, for the harvest of the past that awaits our hunger and all the furtherings this new day will bring. We give thanks. Amen. And our first hymn, if you want to click on the YouTube link, it comes from the First Plymouth Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. Love the size of this choir. Um, and now thank we all our God, that great hymn of gratitude. Karakia. Let us be at peace within ourselves. Let us accept that we are profoundly loved and need never be afraid. Let us be aware of the source of being that is common to us all and to all living creatures. Let us be filled with the presence of the great compassion towards ourselves and towards all living beings. Realizing that we are all nourished from the same source of life, may we so live that others be not deprived of air, food, water, shelter, or the chance to live. Let us pray that we ourselves cease to be a cause of suffering to one another. With humility, let us pray for the establishment of peace in our hearts and on earth. God, help us to live slowly paying attention to our hurts and loves, to move simply and carefully, aware of the needs of those close by, to look softly and tenderly at others and at ourselves, to allow for emptiness so that the strange and strangers find room, to nourish our heart and let it create for us and heal us. Amen. Fat Manu will now lead us in our first two readings. Hanui Tuatai, first reading. Reading comes from Job, book of Job. Then Job answered God, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know, hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust 
and ashes. Panui Tuarua, second reading. Reading from Edward Carpenter. Let your mind be quiet, realizing the beauty of the world and the immense, the boundless treasures that it holds in store. All that you have within you, all that your heart desires, all that your nature so specially fits you for, that or the counterpart of it waits embedded in the whole, in the great whole. For you, it will surely come to you. Yet equally surely, not one moment before its appointed time will it come. All your crying and fever and reaching out of hands will make no difference. Therefore, do not begin that game at all. Do not recklessly spill the waters of your mind in this direction and in that. Lest you become like a spring lost and dissipated in the desert, but draw, from, draw them together into a little compass and hold them still, so still, and let them become clear, so clear, so limpid, so mirror-like. At last the mountains and the sky shall glass themselves in peaceful beauty, and the antelope shall descend to drink and to gaze at her reflected image, and the lion to quench its thirst, and love shall come and bend over and catch their own likeness in you. Thank you, Fa Manu. Now, third reading, Panui Tuatoru. So, excerpts from Little Gidding by T.S. Eliot. If you came this way, taking any route, starting from anywhere, at any time or at any season, it would always be the same. You are not here to verify, instruct yourself, or inform curiosity, or carry report. You are here to kneel, where prayer has been valid. And prayer is more than an order of words, the conscious occupation of the praying mind, or the sound of the voice praying. Here, the intersection of the timeless moment, never and always. The moment of the rose, birth, and the moment of the yew tree, death, are of equal duration. A people without history is not redeemed from time, for history is a pattern of timeless moments. So while the light fails on winter's afternoon in a secluded chapel, history is now and England. The drawing of this love and the voice of this calling, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. The book of Job, <clears throat> it does not pretend to be history. The character in Job didn't literally exist. Rather, it is a literary piece critiquing the ideology of you get what you deserve. 
we see the prevailing view of the time as spelled out in the book of Proverbs was that wisdom was the ability to discern the pattern of God in the world and to conform to it. That pattern was the values of hard work, high morals, moderation, kindness to the less fortunate, etc. If you conform to the pattern, God will reward you. Wisdom brings happiness. The lack of wisdom, misery. Every life got what it deserved, and rewards and punishments were experienced in this life. There was no afterlife theology in those days. So if you were poor and afflicted, you deserved it. If you were rich and healthy, you deserved it. Nothing was said about the effects of differing environments, privileges, structural biases, or temperament. To the degree that a person was successful, God's blessing would be upon them. To the degree that one failed, God's curse would be pronounced. It was and is an ideology that favors the way things are and the powerful who are and credits any success or failure to the individual. Yet even back in the ancient times when it was written, some saw problems with this thinking in the book of Proverbs. For good people did suffer, and evil people did prosper. So one skillful Jewish poet wrote a book to dramatize the issue. In this book, a wise, prosperous, Torah-observant Jew, a.k.a. Job, would do everything right. And then, inexplicably, one day he would begin to suffer. Calamity after calamity. He'd lose wife, children, cattle, health, honor, and prestige. Then he would be visited by representatives of the prevailing wisdom, Job's so-called comforters, who would seek to force his life and tragedies into their frame of reference. The dialogue with the comforters turned on the meaning of life and of suffering and the role of God in that mix. Does God allow evil? Is God less than all-powerful and all-loving? Is there a fundamental duel in the cosmos between good and evil, God and some sort of Satan? Is suffering a pathway to God? Those who have definitive answers to these questions then and now, I think, provide little help to the Jobs and others who suffer. And indeed, for those of a fundamentalist persuasion in this present COVID pandemic time, who label policies or people as either right or wrong, good or evil, based on so-called God's will, such definitiveness can do much damage. For me, these great questions of suffering a bit of place in Meister Eckhart, the medieval mystic of the 13th century, his frame that says relation is the essence of everything that exists. In other words, it's our relationships to one another and to all life on this planet that informs us of the essence of what might be called God. How we relate to one another is fundamental. How we care for those less fortunate, those discriminated against, those survivors of injustice. These things are fundamental. For what we fundamentally do tells others what we fundamentally believe. Our text today from Job comes right at the end of the book. Towards the end of Job's journey of exploration pain. The six verses are not about Job's comforters being right and Job being wrong. 
or Job figuring out that he really was bad or in error and now needed to repent. Such interpretation does a disservice to the book, to the author and to his character, Job. Again, I would read those six verses as being about the framing. Job is saying God's ways are beyond his understanding. God is bigger than Job's culture and Job's own frame. Beyond Job's logic and reasoning and language. Job is here at the end accepting his not knowing, his agnosis, if you like. And in doing so, he's letting go, letting go of his hurts, angers, fears, arguments, just though they may be, and letting be. Is this a stillness, a, a peace we hear in Job? As for verse 6, the bit about repentance, the scholar, the scholar um, Carol Newsom says there are at least six ways of interpreting it. In other words, it's deliberately ambiguous. I would choose to read it as Job turning, that's what the word repent means, from a smaller and inadequate understanding of God and suffering to a larger and ultimately unknowable one. A turning from answers to the questions of why to no answers. Our second reading today comes from Edward Carpenter, that English utopian socialist, poet, philosopher, early activist for gay rights and prison reform, fit right into St. Luke's, and eclectic spiritual explorer. In this well-known piece called The Lake of Beauty, he invites us to quieten our minds, to clothe ourselves both with gratitude, seeing the beauty that is, and with the expectation of hope, a hope that will come in its own time, under its own steam, in its own way. So don't let the anxiety that easily falls upon us when tragedy strikes pull us in this direction or that seeking a remedy. Do not recklessly spill the waters of your mind. Instead, draw those waters as he writes into a little compass and hold them still so still. Let them become clear so clear, so mirror-like. That in time love shall come and bend over and catch her his there own a likeness in you. In the stillness, in the still point that can be you, the reflection of hope, love, God, if you like, is seen. Of course, the path from pain, suffering, and anxiety to a point of quietening the mind, gratitude, and stillness it's quite a journey, as it was for Job, as it is for us. The poem by T.S. Eliot called Little Gidding. It's the last in the series, Four Quartets, one of the classics of the English language. It was first published in 1942, when London was suffering from fire raining down from the skies, aka the Blitz. It was a time when normal was no more, when death and injury were no strangers, and when mental suffering was rife. Little Gidding is a village in Cambridgeshire. And for a while in the 1600s, it was the home of a small Anglo-Catholic community. Importantly, for the poem's inference, it was this community that King Charles I sheltered in following his defeat at the Battle of Naseby, as in the English Civil War. 
So Little Gidding in the poem is more than a quaint English village. It is a metaphor for sanctuary in the midst of suffering. Taking any route, starting from anywhere, at any time or at any season, it would always be the same. We have, and at the same time, simultaneously hope to find, when under duress, our little Gidding. Coming to little Gidding to kneel to pray is, on the one hand, a universal human impulse to cry out to some higher power for help, for relief, for some form of salvation, or at least understanding. I suspect there are times we all do it, when it all feels too much, even if we don't believe in a higher power or its efficacy. On the other hand, Eliot takes us further. He writes, prayer is more than an order of words. The conscious occupation of the praying mind or the sound of the voice praying. Here, the intersection of the timeless moment, never and always. He is, I think, talking about the prayer that is beyond or without language, even beyond or without conscious thought. The prayer that is an intersection, a crossroads of feelings, fears, contexts, calamities, and somehow remarkably, a moment when time ceases, never and always, and the rock fall of fate is no longer a threat. This intersection holds the moment of birth, the rose, and death, the yew tree. It holds the patterns of history, war, plague, sufferings. History is now in England. Eliot's talking about his context, his place, rather than any reference to imperialistic ambitions of England. The census section also holds the possibility of hope. He quotes from the great medieval work, The Cloud of Unknowing, when he writes of the drawing of love, like water drawn from a deep well, and the voice of love's calling. Hope is drawn and speaks to the heart. The next lines are the most well-known of the poem, exploration, and the end being to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. I would suggest these lines like those that follow are best understood in the context of prayer. The journey is, he writes, through the unknown, unremembered gate, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness. And then Eliot quotes Lady Julian of Norwich, who also lived through traumatic times, that of the plague. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. This all shall be well is not wishful thinking or reason thinking either, or some God-given prophecy. Rather, this is about being in that timeless moment, hearing the fears of your heart, but blocking out that noise in order to hear the half-heard stillness. And in the stillness, hope is drawn. I wonder if we, like Job, suffering from the rockfall of fate, can block out the clamor of fearful fretting, to find and hold that half-heard stillness, 
from which love's hope may be drawn or in which reflected. Ainoe Ata Iwi, the prayers of the people. Let us pray. We pray for our community of St. Luke. We pray for Muriel Carruthers. For her children, Alistair and Catherine, and her whole family as they mourn the death of Fiona. Pray for Dorothy and Ian McCarrison. We pray for others we know who are ill or suffering. We pray for those in our community who feel overworked, over anxious, worried about finance or health, or the finances or health of their family. Help us all to find stillness, that elusive timeless moment when we know all shall be well. And we spread our love and concern wider to our city, to our nation, to nations overseas that we barely hear about, places with high death toll from COVID and other diseases and wars, places where there is a lot more suffering. And we pray for wisdom, not the wisdom that says I'm right and you're wrong, but the wisdom that builds community, builds relationships, builds nations together, builds a world where people care. And lastly, dear God, we pray for ourselves, each of us individually. Quieten the fears of our hearts. Help us to open our minds and eyes to the beauty around us and be kind. Amen. So together we pray, O God of many names, the source of life that binds us, your wisdom come, your will be done, and folding from the depths within us. Each day you give us what we need. You remind us of our limits and we let go. You support us in our strengths and we act with courage. For you are the empowerment within, the dwelling place around, the celebration among, now and forever. Amen. And you might like to pause the recording and um, listen to uh, and actually sing along. I think they put the words up on the screen of the brother James Air version of the Lord's My Shepherd. A great hymn of comfort. And the Karakia prayers. Holy whisper, unconditional compassion 
hospitality and mercy. We offer our humble and heartfelt thanks for all the measureless blessings we and so many have experienced. We are grateful for our birth and being, our health and preservation, and all the gifts of this life, especially for the boundless love, the means of grace, and the dream of a new and just tomorrow revealed in Jesus the Anointed. And may we have that due sense of all the gentle mercies of life so that our hearts may be truly thankful and our, and our praise be not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving ourselves to one another in kindness, in service, and in prayer. Amen. The final piece of music. The Waiata the anthem is again from New Zealand Baroque. There's another piece after last week's uh, filmed in St. Luke's. Te Manakitanga, the blessing. Blessed be the moment when time so early late, its relevance not reset, calls the rock fall of fate to cease to be a threat. Blessed be that moment of not caring about worry, of what others might think, of who we are or will be. Instead, in stillness we sink. Blessed be this moment when all is well regardless, Loss and its treasures fade. All men are well, regardless. Here in this serene glade. Blessed be the moment, never and always yet here. A grace of hope, not despair. A place free of hate, snares a space of wonder, prayer. Blessed be still moments. Amen. Peace be with you this week.